Welcome back for the final mile. We are on final mile 49, almost at 50. Wow. Round in the corner. Yeah, man. That's like a, almost a whole year. I'm surprised we've been doing this that long. It seems like fairly recently. We st- It feels recent, I guess, but it's in comparison to how long we've been doing the long form show. That it yeah, just feels it makes sense now. though, because it was, I remember last summer when I was, I was out for like army or something and I was talking to the phone, the three of us were on the phone, me, you yeah, and it was Steven's idea. He's the one that yeah, he's, he's like, you should do like, you should do another segment where it's just Q and a we're like, yeah. And we've actually gotten really good response. Like, so everyone, YouTube comments, thank you very much. This is literally the episode every week where we get the opportunity to serve you guys by answering the questions that you're sending directly to us. Yep. Um, and sometimes like today, we're going to bring in a, uh, a YouTube comment that may be controversial and I'm going to, I'm going to roast, I'm going to roast a, uh, a listener today. We'll have fun. I, for okay. sure. I wanted to kick off rather than doing news or sports, a couple people responded, um, wanted more books that I was just coming across that I think are helpful. That's one of our this, questions today. Well, I, oh. that's going that to be our first one. Cool. I, I summarize that. What books yep. or podcasts are good for prey brokers? So we can do that one first if you want, and that'll segue yeah. right into it. For That's sure. perfect. And this, again, this is like literally YouTube comment, right? We we answer, we try to either answer in the YouTube, answer via email, or answer on the show every single question you guys send in. So uh, before we get into it, really quick, share us with all your friends, coworkers, colleagues. Check out Freight Broker Basics course on our website if you're looking for an educational option. Um, and check out the sponsors in the description box. It's because of them that we can continue to give you guys all these services and podcasts for free. Uh, Quickscope, Levity, Blue Book Services, and DAT, uh, our current um, sponsors there. So, all right, Ben, you had the. This is this is all you, man. So, how did this? Did you mention a book or something, or what was the? Yeah, I think I was talking about the book I was reading past recently. I think it's called Super Communicators. The one. Yes, I was talking we did about. talk about that one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really good practical insight in that book. It's a really good read, the one I referenced before. But this one I came across, actually, there was someone referenced this book in a podcast. It's called 59 Seconds. But it was good enough that I not only have listened to all of it, but I immediately bought the hard copy. And I'll just read you some of the blurbs to get an idea. It's like, at last, a self-help guide that is based on real research. Perfect for busy, curious, smart people. Um, Secrets. It said 59 seconds. Think a little, change a lot. Um, These are some of the interesting ones. And some of these you've probably heard me say on the show, which is why, one, I kind of gravitated towards it. Like, there are things I've picked up and learned in other books. But this is a great book because it summarizes what works and what doesn't work in popular like coaching and self-help or like however you want to categorize it, growth type books, it breaks down and then reads you and tells you why these studies show that these things are effective and why these things are kind of bullshit in some ways, right? And why and what works and what doesn't, right? Um, and just a couple, right? Like discover why even thinking about going to the gym can help you keep in shape. Find out why retail therapy doesn't really improve your mood, but what it actually does. These are my two favorite ones. Discover why writing down your goals is far more effective than visualizing them. In fact, actually, they talk about like just visualizing your goals can make it less likely to achieve them, actually. But writing them down and the steps to achieve them has far higher effective rather than just dreaming and thinking about it you're actually far less likely to do the work. And they say the studies show that you're also not only less likely to do the work to get to your dream, when you just daydream about being rich or what you're going to do with the money you're going to make, you're also unintentionally underestimating the steps it takes to get there. So as soon as something hard comes up, you just quit. There's another study too that shows like if you tell someone else your goals, you actually get a little reward because you kind of feel a little bit of the accomplishment because you're sharing what you're about to do. And that also makes you less likely to actually do the thing that you said you were going to do, which is interesting. That reminds me of uh, Atomic Habits too. Like they yes. talk about, you know, really good playing, sure. partner, et cetera. Yep. And the last one, we talk about this on sales a lot, but they explain why in this book too, but it's finding out why putting a pencil between your teeth instantly makes you happier. So when we talk about sales, right, and we say you should smile, get your energy up, or stand up, right now, do this. 
Put a pen with just the end in your mouth like it's like a cigar and just hold it there like that. That, hold it with your lips, that will literally make you less happy because you use the same muscles to frown that you do to hold a pen in your mouth That's what like felt a cigar. Like. I was like, yep. Now, if you hold it with your teeth clenched and do that for like, I think it's like 10 or 15 seconds. Smiling. Before you start to dial, your brain works in both ways. It tell it will allow your face muscles to smile when you laugh and hear something funny. So it clearly works that way, which everyone knows about. But it works in reverse, meaning that your body is so used to smiling once it's heard something that makes you happy, that if you use those muscles without hearing anything, you're literally just sitting in a quiet room by yourself and you do that, your brain triggers a response that actually fires endorphins and makes you happier. And the tone of your voice changes. And what I learned this when I was getting my like coaching certifications is if you do this before you make prospecting calls, your tone of voice goes up, is more pleasant and is more likely to engage with the person you're talking to. So that is one great takeaway before you make any prospecting calls, just throw a pen in your mouth, clench it with your teeth, count to 15 and then dial. So what's here. So, and I've actually have done something similar. I, so I read Jordan Belford's book, the way of the wolf at like talk, you yep. know, he's the guy from Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. I read this, this is probably like seven years ago or something, but he talks, he hits on that same thing. It's like, if you can find some sort of action that can be easily done to trigger an emotion and his example, he used like a, a scent, like basically like there's these things you can smell that is very distinct. And he's like, he's like, when you have a really good sales call, as soon as you hang up, he goes, do that thing and do it every time after a good call. And your body is going to re- like, like it instantly like boom it's gonna you know associate it with that so then if you have, have a difficult call or a difficult meeting coming up do that action right before you have that call and it's gonna it's very very similar where it's trying to like get your body to think like no this is the that awesome motivation that great mentality i had boom here's how i get to it so um way of the the way of the wolf that's where uh, i heard that one from yep um pot, he, so they also asked about podcasts you can listen to I mean, Freight 360, obviously, but any other for podcast sure. you'd recommend for uh, for freight brokers? Yeah. I mean, the ones that I tend to listen to regularly, like I listen to DAT's podcast because Ken Adamo is on there regularly with Dean. Dean always puts out great information on what commodities are moving, what's going on in the market, which lanes are picking up, which lanes are slowing down. So he'll give you literally categories to prospect that are going right now. And then he'll tell you what was moving last week, what the lanes were, right? Like it's very actionable information, not just a conversation. Ken provides a lot of good insight into rates. And then their guy from uh, Chris, Chris Kaplis, who I believe is from MIT, who does, he's like their head of their analytics or works very closely with Ken. And he always does a really good, insightful discussion on like the economics and even what's happening in the industry. Those are like one of my go to, I listen to all three of them. Freight Caviar, I think Paul over there does some really good interviews. Great interviews. Very poignant that are yeah. really good takeaways where you can learn some things, actionable stuff you can use. Um, everything in logistics, place prod- podcasts. Um, there's some really great stuff over there. Kevin Hills, um, which was put the coffee down, but I believe it Did is Did he change now- the name of it? Yes. And I, f- it's now it's, and I was on his show like two weeks ago and it's, why can't I remember that top of my mind? And it's going to bug me. Um, I just did a really good episode with him. The what's the rate? Yes. What's with, the rate? Um, yeah. And what's he the was, That's what it is. Yeah. Where? He has it on LinkedIn. That's what I'm looking at right now to try to find it. Everything in logistics. Um, we just posted this when I was on their show like last week. So you can definitely find it there. Um, I'll tell you one that I like is I would say anything like entrepreneurial, I think is really good. Um, Entree leadership is one that yeah. I listen to every now and then. It's really good. Like business, business owner mm-hmm. stories. Um, ben, I know you're big on my first, is it my first million, right? 
My first million I still listen to. The ones I listen to also every day or I listen to every week, I listen to my first million. It's basically two guys that kind of have discussions like Nate and I, except they both just research businesses, industries, and like entrepreneurship. So they're talking about like trends, what's going on in different industries. To me, it gives me a really good perspective on a lot of things I don't have time to read and research every week, like what's going on, which companies are buying what, which new startups are working. Um, all in podcasts, I listen to kind of every Friday. That gives me a good recap on kind of what's going on in the tech world. I listen to Hard Fork, which is on the New York Times. That comes out Friday. It's a great recap of everything that happened in the technology space every week. Tim Ferriss, I've just been listening to for years, personal development. Those are like my go-tos that I listen to every week. Nice. Steven, you got any others? And this What's the Bid, by the way. Brought what's to you by Brush okay. Pass Research. Research and Fair Lanes, Kevin Hill. So um, my first million, actually, just a caveat, they just had Craig Fuller from Freight Waves on yes. uh, this past week, which was very interesting. They talked mainly about his fire crown stuff, but they got into the weeds with his dad and being fired. Great episode for anyone in the industry. I haven't listened um, to it yet. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I mean, he did some really cool stuff with the magazine business after Freight Waves and what he's doing with that. Um town which is basically a country club with an airport in it which is apparently doing very very well yeah they sold like 20 28 million up front in like 30 yeah. days and just people that were um re like reserving a, a lot but uh the other ones i listened to the ice coffee hour is a good one for business um there was one is that um who's the kid that runs that one that's Graham Stephan. He does. Graham Stephan, yeah, stuff. he's good, man. I call him yeah. kid. He's like probably our age. He's probably in his thirties, right? Uh, yeah. I think he's. Or is he? Is he younger? Yeah. Like, am I am I wrong I by calling him kid? I think because he got started at like eighteen or nineteen. Okay. Um, and then Alex Hormozzi is another good one. Yeah, big dude. Wouldn't want to get in a fight with him. No. Yeah, his but book's he's, really he's good his, too. Yeah, he's got the marketing uh, and sales stuff down. $100 million offer. I just read his book a few months ago. Really good, really good blueprint to launch any product because he, Alex, I think does a very good job of describing how to launch a business or a successful business and like first principles, like very simply, like you need to be able to answer this question before you can get to this. If you aren't thinking about it this way, you need to ask yourself these questions. This is what common mistakes are made. This is why, this is how you can avoid them. Very, very step by step in a way that I think is very applicable and useful in any business and any sales and anything you're trying to scale or grow. So lots of yep. great stuff that he puts out too. All right. Next question. I got my broker authority about a month ago. And one common issue I keep running across is getting a response of, quote, we're not hiring new brokers or we don't supply the shipping right off the bat and don't even get a chance to offer my services. What tips would you recommend to change those responses to a yes? So this is the common objection of my freight is customer routed. We're not onboarding any new brokers right now, et cetera. And like I, so I've literally uh, like have a new, a new agent that came to our company. And, you know, one of the biggest things is like, Hey, we got to onboard our company instead of his old brokerage with his customer. And like, he's, you know, biggest issues like customers aren't onboarding new brokers. He's, he's like, well, He's like, they will for me because they know me like so the the clear takeaway there is like there is always an exception to policy, right? There is always like if there is a need to get something done, it can get done. Um, what would you say are like your your tactical tips on how to handle that conversation when they say, you know, we don't you know, it's customer out. We're not onboarding anybody. Um, what would be yours? And I'll give you a well, I guess both of you could take a chance and I'll give you a couple of my thoughts, too. The first is I'm going to use a pattern interrupt, meaning why are they saying that they're expecting you to go away, right? They're expecting you to either argue with them or to hang up and move on, right? I'm going to do neither of the two things they expect. I'm going to go, oh yeah, for sure. I wouldn't be expecting you guys to be onboarding anybody right now. Hell, I'm in the market all day. Like I got to imagine you guys got no issue probably coming across capacity and getting trucks to pick up your loads because that's going to make them one. It takes them puts them off guard because they're not expecting it. And what happens is when you respond with something they don't expect, they 
almost always have to just answer honestly because they have yeah. nothing prepared. It's, oh, well, yeah, that, yeah, that's the case. And then I'm going to pivot to why I reached out. Like you, I always have that in my pocket. Like, cause if I'm calling them, there's a reason why they're on my prospecting list, right? Maybe they're in an area geographically. Maybe they are literally located next to a place I deliver to for another customer. Maybe a carrier of mine has said, Hey, I'd really like to pick up these shippers in this area. We're there a lot, whatever that reason is, right? That's what I'm going to go to next. Hey, like I said, the reason I was reaching out is like a couple of my drivers are by your facility, honestly, like weekly. And I had told them you guys aren't likely to be looking for any new carriers or brokers, but at the very least, I said I'd give you guys a ring and see how things were going and see if maybe somewhere down the road we might be able to work something out. Again, taking the pressure out, letting them know that I'm calling for a purpose, not to just sell them on working with me for no reason. And I'm really just trying to get a conversation initiated and getting them talking to me. That's really my only objective at that stage. Yeah. And I think too, like, and you made it, this is exactly what I was going to point out and you kind of did is like to take the pressure off of the conversation and make it relax. You could, you can reference the past or the future. And so it doesn't feel like right now it's like, Hey, how did you got, you know, I understand you guys aren't doing anything new right now. Um, obviously the market shifts a lot. How did you guys handle it? You know, during the peak of the, the 2022, 2021 boom, where, you know, was the onboarding different? What's that process look like? Or vice versa, look to the future. Like, oh, you know, when, when yeah. the, when the market gets tighter and you guys have a different need, what does that process look like? Well, you can shift the focus of the conversation and it releases that pressure. Yes. It's a pressure release, right? And to the second one, I did the one if we're not hiring new brokers or adding carriers, right? If it's, hey, we don't supply the shipping, my response is almost always the same. That's fantastic. And I say nothing and I hold silence. And I just wait for them to respond because they're not expecting that. And then based on their tone of voice, right? I'll be like, yeah, that's great. Like you guys don't have to worry about or coordinate or arrange or deal with any trucks showing up or not showing up for any of your outbound freight. And then I say nothing because usually they'll go, yeah, most of it is handled by our customers. That's my click. Oh, most oh, of it, huh? Yeah. Let me ask you this. I, how, how often do you guys ever have to arrange it? Is it like specific circumstances or is that? And then once I'm done with that topic, I'm going to swing right over to inbound because just because you don't supply the shipping to your customer, you got to ship the product out of your building, it had to get there somehow. I mean, maybe their vendors also include shipping and that does happen. But I would say the thing that almost never happens is that 100% of inbound and 100% of outbound is handled by their vendors and their customers. Like that is just the most unlikely thing that you'll ever come across that if you ask enough questions, you'll find out that 10%, 20%, 30%. I've had people tell me they're FOB and like only 25% of their loads are actually handled by their customers which means they're still handling and arranging 75% of those loads. And that will tell you like, this is more of a blow off than it's usually ever the truth is the reality. Yep. Steven, how about you? You got anything to add there? Yeah, I actually, I just, I just did this yesterday. I had a, a customer I was calling on a prospect and, and they gave me the same spiel. Just, we don't, we're not bringing on any new brokers. And I told him, I was like, you know, I, I understand that I'm not actually looking to bring on new customers. I'm just trying to field some of the information, fill the gaps that I already have on your company and see if you would fit for what I'm currently doing. So I know you have locations X, Y, and Z, and based on your products, you're probably hauling with reefers, maybe dry bands. Do you have anything that you can add that maybe I can put into our system so then when you are bringing on customers, we can talk about this at a later date? That's an interesting way to do it too, yeah. It, it's it's it, funny for me to hear a freight broker say, I'm not looking to add new customers right now, but it's also a huge, uh, the tactic there is a big pressure release for the customer. It. it takes the stress level down. So You've got, I mean, these people are getting 20, 30 calls a day, a week right now, and even more emails. Like to hear somebody say, we're not bringing on customers. It's a tactic, yes, but it'll make you stand out. Nobody else. Yeah, oh, it definitely will make you stand out for sure. So. Well, yeah. And my mine is I say I mean the same. I just phrase it different. Like my like it's like can now. It's just like a habit. I'm like, yeah, for sure. Like, I don't even know if we'd be a fit to work together either. Like, I have no idea if it would even make sense or we could even get you approved as a vendor to work with you. I just thought it was worth a conversation. Right. Like, yeah. 
going for no, right? Yep. Like, hey, for whether sure. you like you're going to tell me no, well, I'm going to tell you I don't even know if I want to work with you before you even tell me no again, right? Like once you get to that point, the pressure is gone and you can both just have a conversation. I don't like you yep. and you don't like me. So tell me a little bit about yourself, right? <laughs> All right. Next question. How do you find reefer LTL carriers that can haul frozen commodities? I've gotten this question so many times and I've got yeah. two solutions, um, both of which re, uh, or involve a co-broker agreement. So number one, I have found a regional brokerage that does reefer LTL um, in the Northeast. And they, I can't remember the name off the top of my head right now because I haven't used them in a while, but um they basically built up a network of carriers, reefer carriers, that will put together similar uh, temp shipments so you can kind of have it like reefer LTL. So they, they're they all the experts in it. They have all the connections. You just co-broker with them. The other one, co-broker as well, which I really like, Expedite All. Um, they're a brokerage based out of Chattanooga. I met these guys at TIA last year and um, they're really good. I think they've even been on Freight Caviar. They did an interview with the guys there, Max. Who are they? Expedite All. So if you go to, I think it's expediteall.com. Um, they are like they specialize in smaller equipment types. Um, one of which being like they could do like refrigerated Sprinter vans or box trucks. So it's it's LTL, but it's not consolidated onto a single tr- like you, you're going to have a dedicated van like a refrigerated sprinter van or something like that but they got like six thousand drivers in their network all vetted you get gps on them at all times we've used them for a few shipments just set up a co-broker earlier this year um and again i've met i've met the guys there in person um they're great to work with so oh, you can get like real-time rates from them 24 7 through their quoting system or you can just run a quote like digitally and it'll tell you what they're guaranteed offer prices. Um, That's awesome. So really, really cool. Co-brokerage agreement. Um, check those guys out. So I was having to quote some of these this week and last week. And I mean, the traditional way to do it, right, is, and it's so tedious and it's so time consuming. Steve and I, you and I have talked about this. Like you've had some ideas about building networks that we've talked through to make this easier. And like where it gets really difficult and why it's so hard and why it's easier in dry van, it's the temp, right? Like I had one last Friday, I think it was lemons or something. I don't know. The point was it was only like five pallets, like seven, 8,000 pounds, but we had to quote a dedicated cause like there wasn't another shipment anyone could find on the load boards to match it up at that temp. Like there were plenty of other reefer loads that needed to go from, I think it was New Jersey to like Orlando, but none of them were at that right temp for like that afternoon. So like I was talking to every driver there, we were all looking at other brokered loads, trying to match anything up even along the way to build our own full truck load, to get the rate down, to work for everybody. And like, sometimes you just can't, right? Like you just gotta send a full reefer with like four or five pallets. And then the shippers yell at you cause they only wanna pay 280 a pallet or 350 a pallet. And you're looking at, and we ran the full truck, it ended up being like, 475 a pallet when you got to pay for the whole truck and that was a good rate too and it's just like it's really hard until you've got a lot of carriers doing this for you a lot of the time and you can match up some of it internally but doing it externally like you just post loads up and you just got to get quotes from carriers and hopefully some of them have other customers along the way to your delivery yeah they put a bunch of partials that they can create a full truckload um Last question. So this was a comment on one of our shorts that talked about like what to do if a driver holds a load hostage and re- requests a higher rate. Yeah, and we talked sense. about what to do. And the guy, the guy comments. I know. He says, <laughs> that's a lie. When carrier accepts freight, he temporarily take custody via BOL till a receiver signs for it. If broker cannot pay you, if p- broker cannot pay, you impound the shipment and try to agree on rate. After 30 days, you send a demand for payment. If broker don't pay, then sell it. Okay. Uh, first of all, bro, you need to learn how to type no. with proper English or grammar or whatever. Uh, but this is absolutely BS. This is not true. not true. This is not true. This is not what you do. Please, carriers, do not do this. Um, you know, you're, If you hold a load hostage – and um, you try to impound it like you are breaking numerous laws. And if you're going to yes. if you're crossing a state line, like even more laws are being broken here. And if you're if you're like a demanding higher rate, like extortion, like 
more broken laws. Um, so no, you, you, this is not what you do. Um, he's not wrong that they are temporarily taking custody of the freight. That is true. Um, but they are not given an open ended time frame on when they have custody. They are contractually obligated to deliver at the des- the the destination that it ha- this constantly on the BOL and the date and time or the window of time um, on that BOL, which is a legal document. So if you try to impound or sell, I mean, you try to sell the freight, you don't own it. You just have physical possession of it. You don't own it. Um, yeah. I read it and it made my blood want to boil. Steven, were you the one that found this and like sent it over and we're like, check this idiot out? Yeah. But yeah. It took a screenshot. It was wild. Like That's what it's it was. Yeah. From 11 days ago. I found the original. Yeah. 11 hey, days his ago. comment makes the YouTube algorithm help us out. So that's cool. Right? For sure. Yeah, it's, a plus. But it's engagement. But don't do that. Do not, carriers, do not do that. And brokers, do not. Uh, do the best that you can to not create a hostile situation where a carrier is going to even think of considering of stealing your customer's freight. What is the target. beginning of this? Like, I don't, I can't obviously watch the short, the one minute. No, so yeah, the, someone asked a question and they said, it was a short that was created from one of our Q&A sessions. And yep. someone asked like, hey, driver is holding my load hostage because they want more money. What do you do? And what my answer was, what we do is um, agree to the rate and then get it delivered and then you'll deduct You'll find them for like, you know, extortion fine. Say they want an extra thousand dollars. Fine. Here's a thousand dollars. Here's your Raycon. And then boom, it gets delivered. All right. Here's your new Raycon again, deducting a thousand dollars for extortion fee. And if you want, you want to go ahead and file my bond, they're not going to pay you because you extorted me yes. to try to, to agree to pay a thousand dollars because you tried to hold my customer's freight hostage if I didn't pay you. Like that's breaking, a, that's breaking a law. So I his, his response, his comment was in response to my advice to. Got it. Basically, yeah. like, don't make it hostile. Just get the freight delivered and then deal with the backlash. So, yeah, I, this happened to me when I worked at TQL. And it's your Canadian fact, one you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And I remember it was the same thing. Like, and this was early on. Like, I was on probably only a freight broke like four or five months. And it's exactly what our legal team advised us. They're like, agree to whatever they're saying, document all of it. It's all in a recorded call. Write down everything that's happening and why. And just agree to what they're asking to get the customer's freight to where it needs to be. Then you deal with it after the fact. And as long as you got it all documented, to your point, if it goes to the bond company, it's a clear case of who was wrong and who wasn't, right? Yeah. And it's a whole lot different, right? If a carrier is just asking for more money for no justified reason, as opposed to maybe the carrier was misled and feels like the broker didn't tell them the truth. And I think that's a different situation, right? If the broker tells the carrier, hey, it's a 35,000 pound load and the tr- driver gets there and they load his truck up to 43.5, right? And he agreed to a rate on a lighter load or s- s- even worse as a 20,000 pound load and they load them out to max. Like that is on the broker and the carrier, if they document it, would be able to file on the bond. And my guess is the bond would agree with the carrier, right? It's not just a one way thing. Like these can go yeah. where the broker was wrong. Noting. Yes. Right. And you know, think about anything could. like, Hey, they, they, there was a lump ride to pay or, Hey, there was detention. Yeah. I want you to send me a new rate con that it documents my new rate. Totally. Yeah. We're not saying don't pay care is what they're due, right? What they, what exactly. they earned. It's when they're, when they're saying like, Hey, I'm going to hold this hostage unless you pay me an extra two grand. Like yes. if it's nefarious, that's right. what we're referring to, to be clear. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Steven, sure. you ever deal with one of those fun ones? Yeah, I had one a couple months ago. It was uh, a guy wanted how the situation, we reached out to him because he wasn't on tracking and he wasn't answering phone calls, wasn't answering emails. And Finally, I sent the email, said, you're no longer hauling this. We found a new carrier that or whatever. Um, come to find out that the guy just <laughs> disregarded our instructions and um, had picked up the load already. So he had it, went and parked somewhere and demanded, I, th- I think it was an extra like two grand. But the kicker was, which I thought was funny, um, he wanted the Meyer, 
the money wired up front. And I told him policy states we can only send you half, which was less than what he agreed to. So we sent him half up front. He went and got delivered, asked for the other half. And I, just like you said, I sent him the rate confirmation with the deducted amount that he asked for, and we paid him the remainder 30 days later. But There you go. Anything ever come of it? Like, did he try to go after your bond? It, I feel like when, when that well, happens, no, they usually did. realize, like, yeah, he, what did, he did come out for the bond, and uh, we sent out everything to the bond company, and they responded with, this has all been denied. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. I've, I've dealt with bond companies a couple times, when they're, and, like, it's so funny, like, because they that's literally, like, that's all they deal with. Is like people, you know, their 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 customer service is like. I would imagine it's got to be like ninety five percent just like BS cases of someone trying to file an unjustified claim on a bond. Um, well, but yeah, speaking of unjustified claims, it's crazy the one that keeps popping up all the time is hilarious. About a year and a half ago, a manager had two or three loads that he had booked with a double broker and found it prior to payment and found the real carrier, paid them up front, and denied payments to the double broker. And yep. immediately afterwards, they filed on our bond to get payment. We submitted all the documentation, surety bond, denied it. Two weeks ago, they filed the same claim again with our surety bond, trying to get paid from a year and a half ago. The surety bond responded and said, you've already filed this. It's been denied. Dude, we, we had someone, I think it was last week, a double broker who we knew was a double broker. We caught him as a double broker literally ha- hired a lawyer to send like a demand letter for us to pay them. And I'm what? like, how dumb what? are they? What was the situation? It wasn't, it wasn't like uh, FLQ or double, something. Was it? Double broker. What's that? It wasn't FLQ or something like that. Was it? Cause we got the same letter. I don't remember the name of the carrier. Cause it, it was from months ago. And it like the, this demand letter showed up like last week, but basically, uh, we hired a carrier. They rebrokered to another carrier. We paid the correct carrier. Like we found it all out because the actually the first carrier that rebrokered it, um, like, didn't use tracking. Couldn't give us an ELD down. Like, couldn't do anything to prove location of anything. While this other carrier could, um, we paid the correct carrier. The double broker fraud carrier, like, tries to file a bond. That's not working. They tried to demand money via email from us. That doesn't work. So they had a lawyer. Set, like an attorney's office, send us a like a demand letter for payment, and we're like, "Are you kidding? Like your your client is a fraudster that committed a crime, like and like it's just oh my god, wild." But anyway, yeah, they didn't didn't get their money. So good question. Got, what else you got? I got something. I, this is a funny note to end on. So this came back from we'll call it a prospect um, from one of the guys, one of our brokers. And it, at the top, it talks about, you know, like the standards for all their loads and their RFQ, right? Like, you know, reefer lanes, what's in them, typical pallet count for shipment, right? All the normal stuff. And then this is the part I love. At the end, after it says what we need from carriers. And again, it gives you like all the normal stuff you'd see, updated rates, the time frame. This is the best. Almost all of these solicitations claim to specialize in drayage, OTR, power only, oversize, hazmat, FTL, LTL, dry van, reefer, flatbed, intermodal, and service all provinces and all states. If you offer everything, you specialize in nothing. <laughs> what I'd like to know is what makes you different, what sets you apart from the others. Low rates are nice, but what can you offer me in terms of response time, customer service, tracking, ethics, and professionalism? Please let me know if you need anything else for me and please address these last two lines in your response. And we say this all the time. That's the that like, that's customer. This is, this is what we think people think. And we talk about it. Right. And we've interviewed shippers that say this, but like that's literally in their response. Right. To one of the brokers who's had a conversation or two and like, it looks like they're going to onboard us, but like, you could tell like he gets so many of these yeah. that he just typed that out and yep. sent it to everybody. And I was like, as soon as I read that, I was like literally laughing. Cause I was like, we say this all the time, right? Like if yeah. you specialize in everything, 
you specialize in nothing. Yeah. He even wrote it better than we said. If you offer everything, you specialize in nothing. And yep. I'm like, I couldn't have said that better. <laughs> yeah. No, you're that's that dude. That's hilarious. I love it. Well, good questions. Keep sending them our way. You got the contact form on our website. You got YouTube comments. Um, you've got info, info. at free360.net. Yep. The direct email line, Facebook group questions, you name it. So final thoughts. Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills.